Good evening. I'm glad you can join with us this evening as we study in the book of Luke. Reach for your Bibles and turn to them to Luke chapter 7. Without question, Jesus during his time on earth amazed many people. The disciples, even after having been with Jesus for over three years, never lost their sense of amazement towards Jesus. Even during the last week of his life, after the disciples had no doubt seen hundreds upon hundreds of miracles, when Jesus caused a fig tree to wither, Matthew tells us that the disciples were amazed. People were and continue to be amazed by Jesus. Jesus was and is amazing. But you did, did you know that Jesus himself was amazed on occasion? What in the world would ever amaze Jesus? Well, there are two times that we're going to be talking about. We're told Jesus was amazed on both occasions. Faith was the focus of his amazement. Jesus was amazed at the lack of faith of those living in his hometown. We see that in Mark chapter 6. And here in Luke chapter 7, Luke is amazed by the level of faith shown by, of all people, a Roman centurion. Now, faith has been defined as many different things. But to put it very simply, faith is trust. Charles Blondin was a French tightrope walker and an acrobat. He toured the United States in the mid-1800s and was best known for crossing Niagara Falls, usually without a safety net. He did it many times in different ways. Probably his most daring feat was to push a wheelbarrow loaded with a heavy sack of concrete across the wire. With all that weight, the slightest overbalance could pull the wheelbarrow out of his hands or twist him off the wire into the falls. But Blondin was the ultimate showman. He was the master of the high wire. He regularly took the wheelbarrow all the way across the falls without an issue. One day, after successfully doing so, Charles Blondin asked an impressed reporter who was there, Do you believe I can do anything on the tightrope? Oh, yes, Mr. Blondin, said the reporter. After what I've seen today, I believe you can do anything. Do you believe then, said Blondin, that instead of putting a sack of cement, I put a man in this wheelbarrow, a man who has never been on a tightrope before, and wheel him without a safety net safely to the other side. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Blondin, said the reporter. I believe it. Good, said Blondin. Then get in. I want to tell you, it's one thing to express belief. It's another different thing to get in. You say faith is a doing word. It's a word of action. And faith is always placed in something. The object or the person is the foundation of your faith. As an example, if I had a, a three-legged stool up here today, I have faith in the integrity of that stool to hold me up. But if one of those legs in that stool is faulty, I'm going to tumble. Now, how many have ever discovered, probably the hard way, that the power or the integrity behind any promise is the person who made the promise? Our faith isn't a blind faith. It's not based on a feeling or a hunch. Our faith is solid. We place our faith, our trust in Jesus. Our faith is based on God's character, God's track record, and God's word. The power behind the promise of Christianity is the person, Jesus. He's absolutely faithful and trustworthy. Now, in Luke chapter 10, or chapter 7, excuse me, Luke the 7th chapter, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. And here we meet a Roman centurion whose faith leaves Jesus himself amazed. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all of these things to the people, he returned to Capernaum. Uh, Jesus was just finishing sharing the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and so on. And the Bible says he re returns to Capernaum. T Capernaum has become kind of his home base. Then we go to verse 2. At that time, the highly valued slave of the Roman officer was sick near death. So we have a, a lot of information packed in this short little verse. First of all, we have a Roman officer. The, the Bible says he's a centurion. 
He would have been a Gentile. Without question, this man would have been raised in a pagan household, not a Christian household, but a pagan household. He was a Roman who was in charge of a hundred men. He was a centurion, all of whom were enemy occupiers, hated by the Jew. He was one of the most unlikely people you'd ever expect to amaze Jesus. We're told that this man had a highly valued slave. Now, it's safe to assume that this centurion had a lot invested financially in this servant. But the story is also very clear that this man is valued not just because he was a slave, but as someone who this centurion deeply cared for. And he's sick near death. Look at verse 3 with me. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So, he's heard about Jesus. Undoubtedly, he's heard about the miracles and the words of the Lord. No man speaks like this. What do you suppose he's heard? Well, he's probably heard about Jesus, and this leads him to ask some Jewish leaders to approach Jesus about coming and healing a slave. Now, let's think about this for just a moment before we move on. This centurion's servant is sick and near death. This man has the power of Rome behind him, the centurion, but no matter how powerful he is, he can't heal his servant. This man was wealthy. His bank account was full. But all the money in the world could not heal his servant. But this man heard about Jesus. And it's a good thing he did because one encounter with Jesus ends up changing everything. Look at verses 4 and 5 with me tonight. So they, the Jewish leaders, earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people, and he's even built a synagogue for us. Now, okay, this isn't normal. This is really a special guy. The Jewish leaders were not in the habit of being fond of Roman soldiers. Remember, they were the occupying force. But these Jewish leaders, they go to bat for this centurion. And they try to convince Jesus that because of how good this man is, he deserves a miracle. Has anyone besides me ever used that tactic in prayer? Lord, if anyone deserves your help, I do, or they do. It's kind of like God owes us something if we can get enough gold stars for good behavior. The Jewish leaders approach Jesus because of this man deserves to have you do this for him. Now, why did they feel he was deserving? Well, over time, it became clear that this man was different. He had a genuine affinity for the Jewish people. He built them a church, a synagogue. I had to do a little research, but I found out that it appears that a typical foot soldier at this time in the Roman army received about 225 denarii as an annual salary, annual. A centurion like this man could expect to earn somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 denarii a year. So this guy was more than capable to finance the construction of a synagogue, and in fact, he had done so. As a side note, archaeologists have determined that Capernaum had only one synagogue. Most likely, it was the one built by this centurion. Let's look at verse 6. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. We don't know if the Jewish leaders' arguments were the reason Jesus came. We just know Jesus went with them. Now, Jesus was a very busy man, yet he was willing to fit into his schedule to going to see this man. Jesus had a long track record of coming to those who were in need that called on him. This is kind of funny. First, the centurion sins asking Jesus to come to his house. But now, as Jesus is journeying there, now, just before Jesus shows up, he sends some friends to tell him not to bother, not to come. 
Be interesting to know what happened in his thought process. He still wanted Jesus to heal his servant. He just didn't want Jesus to come to his home. The Jewish elders had been trying to convince Jesus of how worthy and how deserving this man was. Now the centurion himself is saying, he is not worthy or deserving. Maybe he had some guilt about something in his life that caused him to feel unworthy. Perhaps he suddenly grasped how holy Jesus was and how unholy he was. We don't know. We just know he didn't consider himself worthy of being in the presence of Jesus. Let's look at verses 7 through 8. He said, I am not worthy to come and meet you. Just say the words from where you are and my servant would be healed. I know this because I am under authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. I love that phrase, just say the word. Just say the word. This man has a clear picture and understanding of who Jesus is. He's a foreigner. He's the least likely person, but he ends up understanding better than anyone else of his day just how far Jesus' authority reaches and how far it operates. So much so that verse 9 says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't found such faith like this in all all of Israel. The centurion understood that a person in authority has the power to delegate authority in order to accomplish his or her purposes. The centurion knew that he didn't have to be in the presence of Jesus to receive his miracle. The centurion sees Jesus as a commander just like himself. And he recognizes that Jesus has the authority in the spirit world to heal, period. He knew Jesus' words had the power and the authority to accomplish whatever he spoke from wherever he might be. He said, just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. Look at verse 10. And when the officer's friend returned to his house, they found the slave, the servant, completely healed. Now, This is especially interesting to me. Luke, probably the most detailed of the gospel writers, never mentioned Jesus ever saying a word. What did the centurion say? Just say the word. Yet, there's not one word recorded here in Luke regarding what Jesus said. We're just told the man's friends returned to the house, and when they got there, the servant, was completely healed. Jesus healed the man without even saying a word. Jesus didn't go. Jesus didn't touch the servant. He didn't offer a public prayer. He didn't do anything outwardly, yet the man was healed. And that's the power of faith. I love this story, this encounter with Jesus. And I believe there are several things the Lord is wanting to communicate to you and I through His Word today, this study. See, the centurion wanted or desired a word of healing, but the truth is, it wasn't needed. Then what was needed? Faith. His faith. His faith was the catalyst that caused the power and the authority of Jesus to bring the victory without a word into his circumstances. The Lord hasn't lost his authority over whatever it is you have or what you may be facing. You don't really need a word today. It's time to stop trying to get God to do whatever it is you need Him to do. But by faith, just simply possess what He's already provided. John 19.30 says, It is finished. Ephesians 1.20 Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Why is He seated? Because it's finished. Ephesians 1.3 We praise God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has... That is past tense. Who has blessed us with every blessing in heaven because we belong to Christ? 
I like 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by his wounds. You were, you were, past tense, you were healed. There are things in your life you've been hoping God would do or trying to get him to do. And it's not a matter of trying to get God to move in your life. It's a matter of you moving into agreement with him and receiving what he has already provided for you. As an example, if you had a present under the tree with exactly what you desire at Christmas time, but if it's just sitting under the tree and you don't wrap it, unwrap it, you're never going to enjoy it, even though it's clearly marked with your name on it. It's available to you. Sometimes it's easy to think, if Jesus were here in the flesh and we were to, he was to lay his hand on me or, or uh, upon that person that I'm praying for, I, I'd be instantly healed. That's nice, probably true, but an encounter with Jesus is simpler than that. In fact, an encounter with Jesus doesn't require him being physically present. What made the centurion's faith so amazing? It's this, trust, simple trust. I love the story of the lady who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. It's an awesome story. Her, her faith was dependent upon her ability simply to touch the hem of his garment. The centurion on their hand, his faith didn't require any more than a, than a word. He knew that Jesus' authority would decide the outcome of the situation. It was simple trust. And Jesus responds to simple trust. Sadly, many Christians limit God. God can do anything. But because of our unbelief, God will not work in our situation. God honors faith. God is pleased when you approach Him in faith, believing that He will answer your request. God is pleased with you. Obey Him in faith, trusting Him to fulfill the clear promises found in His Word. Will you trust Him? Faith honors God and faith honors, uh, God honors faith. This centurion had what we might call long distance faith. It was a reach out and touch someone type of faith. He believed that Jesus had the power and the authority to accomplish whatever he willed whenever and wherever the need might be. And he was right. If I pray for God to heal a broken marriage in another state, the Lord is not limited by time or space. If I pray for a sick friend or a family member four states away or across the globe, the Lord is not limited by time or space. Jesus can speak his word across whatever distance and delegate his power to be exer exercised by you and by me here and now on behalf of absolutely anyone, anywhere, at any time. I can pray that the miracle of God can happen in my life as I simply trust him. I want to pray for you today to help us trust him for those that need a miracle in their life. Or maybe you have someone upon your heart. Would you join with me in prayer right now? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you in our lives. Thankful for the story in the book of Luke regarding the centurion. And Lord, help us just to release our faith. Sometimes we think it takes a whole lot of faith. No, it's the mustard seed type of faith. Just a small amount. Because it's not us moving the mountain, it's you. So we trust you today for the situations of those that are listening to this message right now and pray, Lord, that you would perform the miraculous in their life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, well, I want to thank you for joining with us this evening in our Unplugged Bible Study. We'll see you again next week. God bless. Thank you for listening to that message. If you responded to it, we'd love to pray and connect with you. Simply go to www.tlfchurch.com slash tlf-online, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, leave your contact information, drop a message, hit submit, and we'll have one of our church leaders reach out to you. We ask that you faithfully continue in your commitment and generosity. Remember, you can give online through our website, or you can send your tithes and offerings by mail. 
You can find out all the ways to do that by going to our website at www.tlfchurch.com slash online dash giving. Once again, we thank you so much for your continual support during this challenging time. On Sunday nights, our prayer team is committing an hour of prayer from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you have any prayer requests or praise reports, please leave us a message on the website or you can email us at prayer at tlfchurch.com or send us a text at 323-389-7006. Once again, we thank you for joining us online today. We hope and pray that you were encouraged and that you were blessed by that message. Have an awesome week. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you again next week. God bless.